Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm joined uh, by the Public Health uh, Officer here in New South Wales, Dr Kerry Chant, uh, also by the Education uh, Minister, Sarah Mitchell, the Treasurer, uh, Matt Keane, and the Customs Service uh, Minister, Victor Dominello. Uh, can I begin by thanking all our health workers once again uh, for the work that they are doing day and night, ensuring people right across our state are cared for, loved for and kept safe uh, during uh, this period of time. It has been a difficult two years uh, for everyone across the state, but we are so blessed to have the best frontline health officers, our nurses, our doctors, our paramedics, uh, working tirelessly each and every day to help get us through. And on behalf of everybody across our state, can I thank you uh, very much for everything that you are doing, uh, not just at this time, but everything that you have done um, over a challenging two years for our state. Today we're making um, an important announcement uh, for mums and dads, parents right across the state. Uh, we're providing $500 vouchers for before and after school care. Uh, we know that for parents this pandemic has been incredibly tough, balancing uh, homeschooling uh, with work, and we want to do whatever we can uh, to improve that daily juggle. Uh, so uh, this announcement today, uh, this $500 voucher, will put a downward pressure uh, on family budgets, uh, but importantly, uh, help mums and dads balance work and family life. Uh, we know it's been a challenge, uh, and we know in a modern environment of getting up, going to work, getting the kids to school, doing those things can become enormously challenging and difficult. Uh, so uh, through Service New South Wales, which um, the Customer Service Commissioner will give, Minister, sorry, uh, will give uh, some further information on, just like those other vouchers, the Dine and Discover vouchers, uh, this before and after school uh, care voucher will provide assistance and help mums and dads right across our state. Uh, we've always said we want to make sure that parents come first uh, in this state. We know cost of living is a challenge for many, many families. Uh, and this support today, we believe, will make a real difference. We've spoken about in the past um, of the importance of greater support for childcare, greater support for early childhood education. And we, have ideas around that in terms of taking greater responsibility uh, here in New South Wales. We believe that's the best approach going forward. But for the levers that we do have, we want to do everything that we can as a state to help mums and dads right across New South Wales. And I believe that these payments through these vouchers will provide that important support for those mums and dads across the state who use before and after school care to help balance working family life. Um, it also will provide uh, provide important support uh, for the industry. We know that uh, before and after school care, just like childcare, just like early childhood education, has also gone through a difficult time over the last two years. And providing this extra support for parents uh, will support providers as well. Um, the final point I want to make today, we've got a host of speakers uh, today for you, um, is the boosters. We say it every, uh, we say it every day, and we'd love it on the news if you could say it every night. Uh, and that is please go out and get a booster shot. Uh, we're currently sitting around 40 per cent um, of the eligible population has received a booster shot here in our state. But we have so many appointments available at our 40 centres here uh, in New South Wales, plus through your pharmacist uh, as well as your GP. Uh, we know that people have made an incredible effort, an incredible effort over two years uh, to go out and get vaccinated. Uh, booster shots are key to that as well. So if you haven't received your booster shot yet, if it's been three months uh, since your second dose vaccination, uh, please go out, make an appointment today. Uh, boosters are key to keeping you safe during this time. Uh, it's very clear on all the evidence, whether that's in New South Wales, across the country or around the world, boosters are the best protection in keeping you safe. Uh, we appreciate that everyone has made enormous efforts. We know uh, it's been a pain in the past to go and get those appointments made. But those appointments are crucial. Getting boosted is crucial to keep you and your family safe. So can you please, my message right across our state today is please make an appointment, please get boosted and do so as soon as you can because that will ensure you and your family remain safe during this difficult time. I'm now going to have uh, Dr Kerry Chant, our Chief Health Officer here in New South Wales, provide a public health update and Sarah Mitchell, uh, our Education Minister here in New South Wales, provide some information um, in relation uh, to this before and after school package. The Treasurer uh, will then speak to the business support yesterday, which I know has been received very well by small businesses across the state. 
as we have said throughout this entire pandemic, we have the backs of every business in New South Wales. It has been incredibly challenging over the last two years, but our success in this state has been putting businesses and people before the budget, and we will continue to do that day in, day out, right across our state. Because we know going into this uh, Omicron variant, our unemployment rate was incredibly low at 4%. That success has been back on the back of the financial packages that we have provided over the last two years and the spirit and the effort of our businesses and workers to get through. And that will be our focus as we move through um, this next difficult period of time as well. I'll then pass to the customer service minister, Victor Dominello. He'll tell you how it'll all work uh, through the seamless uh, app Service New South Wales. So New South Wales has over 95 per cent of people aged 16 plus with one dose and 94 per cent of aged 16 plus with two doses. That 12 to 15 year old age group is still creeping up, but um, quite stubbornly so. So please come out and get vaccinated. The first dose coverage is 83.2 per cent and the second dose is 78.5 per cent. We've got 38.7 per cent of children in that 5 to 11 year old age group and we're hoping to see that number continue to rise and just echo the Premier's comments about the importance of coming forward, um, getting your first vaccine if you haven't had been vaccinated and also that booster dose. We've currently got 40.8 per cent of the eligible population who've received the booster. I can't be clearer that a booster is essential in providing and maximising your protection against the Omicron variant. Two doses against the Omicron variant are not sufficient. You need the third dose. So anyone thinking that two doses is enough, um, can I, I can't be clearer. Please get that booster dose and get it as soon as possible. In terms of the um, number of cases in hospital, we have 2,779 people in hospital, including 185 people in ICU, of whom 67 are ventilated. There were 13,026 positive test results, including 5,664 positive rapid antigen tests and 7,362 positive PCR tests. Sadly, today we're reporting the deaths of 27 people with COVID, 17 men and 10 women. And can I extend my condolences to the families for their loss? Of the 27 people who died, five were in their 60s, six were in their 70s, 10 were in their 80s and 6 were in their 90s. Eight people who had received three doses of the vaccine, 16 people had received two doses and three were not vaccinated. And of the four who died who were under the age of 65, three were men and one was, wom one was a woman. And three had received two doses of the vaccine and one person was unvaccinated. All four had significant underlying health conditions. Uh, whilst my comments around the booster dose apply to everyone that is eligible, I particularly want to make a call out for those with chronic underlying health conditions and for those that are elderly. Um, I think as I tragically have read out the deaths that have occurred, you can see that there is a preponderance of people that are the elderly and those with underlying health conditions. And COVID will continue to impact on those individuals and being vaccinated, being boosted and taking those extra steps if you have those underlying health conditions to protect yourself and for the loved ones around people who have got those conditions to take those common sense steps um, will ensure that we keep people as safe as possible as we learn to transition to this environment where COVID will be with us. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here at Rose Hill Public School. Can I thank Tony, the principal, and some of the staff and the students who are here in uniform a day early to welcome us? Uh, it's a great school that you've got here, and I know you're very well prepared for the rest of the students to come back tomorrow. Uh, look, as the Premier said, this is a really exciting day for many families across New South Wales with the announcement of this new $500 per child before and after school care voucher. 
We know that a lot of working families, and particularly our essential workers, rely really heavily on these before and after school care and vacation services. And so this is all about helping with that affordability, helping with the household budgets, knowing that you can apply for this voucher through Service New South Wales at the end of February and get that $500 credit that you can then give to your provider and have that come off the cost uh, of your early childhood education cost when it comes to before and after school care. For parents and families, it will be a really simple process, very similar to those who are familiar with things like Active Kids and Creative Kids. We've set the system up well, and I want to thank Service New South Wales and Minister Dominello for working with us to deliver this, uh, this outcome. And it also builds on our election commitment. You know, we've already talked about wanting to increase the amount of places that are available to families. We've done that significantly right across New South Wales. But this is about the affordability component. And I think this $155 million investment in making before and after school care more affordable for families is really important. And I know it will be welcomed by a lot of working parents across New South Wales. Today's announcement about providing vouchers to support uh, parents getting their kids into before and after school care is another way the New South Wales Government is supporting families through this very difficult time. Uh, last year was unprecedented for families who had to juggle work, family, with the, the addition of homeschooling. So we want to do everything that we can to make it as easy as possible to get kids back to school and parents back to work. We also want to make sure that childcare, particularly before and after school, is as affordable and accessible as possible. And that's why we're announcing these announcements. We understand how difficult it is for families at the moment who are facing increasingly uh, higher costs of living. So this government is absolutely focused on reducing the cost of living for families right across New South Wales. In addition, these vouchers will support the before and after school care sector who are doing it really tough. Last year, with homeschooling happening, uh, those businesses really were going to the wall. So this is about also supporting them through this difficult time. Just like we're supporting before and after school businesses, so too are we supporting the small businesses across New South Wales. And yesterday, I wrote to Treasurer Frydenberg and officially told him that the risk to the New South Wales economy was a 4 per cent contraction if case numbers go up uh, over the next quarter. This is such a huge burden that will be borne by our small and medium businesses, and they need the Commonwealth Government's help now more than ever. The New South Wales Government is stepping up to the plate. We want to ensure that small businesses in New South Wales, particularly those that have been hardest hit, retailers, tourism, hospitality, restaurants, cafes, are able to keep trading so that we can ensure that we see our economy bounce back stronger on the other side. The New South Wales Government is doing its bit and we continue to call on the Commonwealth to stand by small business. Don't step aside from small business. Uh, good morning, everyone. The financial support packages uh, outlined by the Premier and Treasurer today and over the last few weeks are of vital importance. But equally, uh, what is important is making it easy to get access to that financial assistance. And what we've done here in New South Wales, which is unique in this country and indeed around the world, is making sure that we can provide that digital access uh, through the Dine and Discover infrastructure so that people can access these vouchers on their smartphones. And that's super simple. And we've seen time and time again how successful that's been and how popular that's been with the people of New South Wales. Over five million people have now received their Dine and Discover vouchers and we'll be using that infrastructure to roll out the parent New South Wales vouchers, the stay New South Wales vouchers and the before and after school care vouchers. It will all appear on your service app and I'll have more to say about that very soon in relation to the timing. Uh, if I could have a particular call out today uh, for the stay vouchers. There are a whole lot of accommodation providers in New South Wales that have done it really, really hard over the pandemic. Whether it's international border closures or state border closures, they've done it really hard. If you uh, want to get access to the stay New South Wales vouchers, which every adult in New South Wales will get, that's $50 voucher on their service phone, 
well then please register your interest today. Now if you've already registered uh, for a Dine Discover voucher, you don't have to re-register. But if you haven't and you want to participate, please register. Go online, service.nsw.gov.au, register, and then once you register, you download the Service for Business app and away you go. So whether you're a hotel in the city, a motel in the bush, or a caravan park in the coast, please register today because these vouchers will be very important to you to stimulate the economy and get us back on our feet even better than before. Um, finally, I'd just like to say that uh, these vouchers will be available seven days a week and including public holidays. Thank you. No questions. Just want to back that in from what Victor's just gone through. It's really important that we do have providers. So obviously, when we announce vouchers, those uh, many people register for them. But ultimately, there's a call out as well, particularly those accommodation providers, hotels, motels. Uh, please come forward, contact Service New South Wales to register your business so that you can be approved. So when those vouchers do come live, uh, you'll be able to have uh, your business qualify for uh, for, for use uh, as part of this plan. Questions? It's going well. I mean, we obviously launched the, the plan um, last week. Um, we've got a number of services on. We're increasing train. Uh, obviously, the train timetable continues to be run on the weekend service, but we will be increasing I think it's a couple of hundred um, services during um, during the peak hour, so during uh, before school and after school. Um, and obviously we'll work, we'll work through that. We do know that many parents during this period of time will likely either drive their, drive their kids to, to school because there are obviously concerns about public transport. Importantly, we say for public transport across our state, whether it's a bus, ferry uh, or train service, uh, if you're over 12 years old, please wear a mask. Um, uh, They're the rules that we have in place. We're obviously not going to um, so the kids can't get on public transport, but we just ask parents, please make sure that if your child is above 12, they do carry a mask with them um, as, we, as we move through this, um, this phase. And as well, if you live close to school uh, and, and, and you can walk or you can ride your bike, please, please do that. But uh, we've, we've worked very closely, not just as part of our back to school plan uh, for getting uh, kids back in the classroom, but obviously getting them, as, as, getting them there as well is just as important. Regarding, regarding the advice of the critical intelligence unit, Given that advice that hospitalisation for life to rise with Omicron, why did you effectively ignore that and push on with what you've changed from December 15? Well, that, that, that's, that's incorrect. What we have, what, we, we, what we've always known, what we've always known in our state um, is that as we open up, case numbers will increase, hospitalisations and ICUs will increase. We've known that. We cannot eliminate the virus. There is no country in the world that has been able to eliminate the virus. What has been key here in our state and across our country compared to anywhere else in the world has been our vaccination rate. Now, we've spoken for a long time about learning to live alongside the virus. We've spoken about that day in, day out. And I know this is difficult. I know this takes some getting accustomed to as we move through. But we've always said we'll tailor our settings to the circumstance we find ourselves. And importantly, in addition to that, we've always said that as, we've opened, as we do open up, hospitalisations and ICUs will increase. That is the reality of living in a pandemic. There is no jurisdiction anywhere in the world, not one country, that, that has been able to eliminate this virus. We have to learn to live in the world as it is, not as we want it to be. But what we can do is what we've done here in our state, not just in the 10 years leading up to this pandemic, by investing record amounts in our health system, but at the outset putting another $4 billion in to ensure that we increased our ICU and hospitalisation capacity here in our state. That is, that is what we can do. We've always said our focus as we move through this period is on hospitalisations and ICUs. Every Friday as we release that tracking on the modelling that we have, uh, we, are no, we, we know that we are, we are tracking well within our capacity. The suggestion, the suggestion that somehow those changes, we are seeing we are seeing right across the country an exponential increase in cases uh, right across the board. Our job as a government, like all governments across the country, is investing in our health system, promoting our vaccination 
program here in our state and importantly keeping society open and instilling confidence and the best way of instilling that confidence is ensuring that people out right across New South Wales are getting vaccinated. When you, when you had that advice and you accepted that hospitalisation was going to thrive, were you effectively also accepting that hundreds of people in that period now would die? We've always known that. That's the hard reality that faces all governments. We've always known, as we open up society, that there will be an increase in hospitalisations and ICUs. That's, been our, that's, that's the difficult decision that governments need to make day in, day out. We cannot eliminate the virus. What we can do, as we've seen in our state, compared to any country in the world, we've seen downward pressure on the hospitalisation system because of the vaccination rates here in New South Wales. So the, the, and I know, despite the fact we've been talking about living with a virus, and I know these are difficult conversations to have, but the reality is we can't eliminate. We are, that, is not, that is not this government strategy. That is not the national strategy. That is only a strategy that, make, that, that I think China and Hong Kong are pursuing. No one else is doing that. We've made difficult decisions, and as a former treasurer over the last two years, to put restrictions in place when we had an unvaccinated population, which meant that many businesses had to close and that many people lost their jobs. As we move through this phase, as we open up, there will continue to be hospitalisations. There'll continue to be an increase in, uh, well, we're seeing a stabilisation in hospitalisations in an ICU, but, but that's just the difficult reality that we have to face into each and every day. And this has been a difficult transition. There's no doubt about that. It was always going to be. If you look at the UK and the US and, and other countries where case numbers were so high and death numbers were so high, the reason that, is, that, that occurred was because their vaccination rates were so low and they weren't able to control the virus. Now, early on in those alpha and delta outbreaks right around the country, every, as part of the national plan, every state and territory took on lockdown so that we could reduce that pressure um, and, in essence, get close to eliminating the virus. We always, made, we always had signed up to the national plan that was originally at 70 to 80%. We increased that out to close to 95%. Once we, get to, once we got to 95%, an incredibly high vaccination rate, we knew, we knew that we had the capacity and the strength as a people to face into it. These are not easy conversations. They're not easy decisions. But ultimately, the alternative is to close businesses. And that is not the approach we're taking in New South Wales or any state around the country is taking as we move through. I support the Treasurer every single day in fighting for New South Wales to get further funding. When I was Treasurer, it's exactly the approach I took. Um, and ultimately, uh, we have levers at a state level to provide financial support for our businesses. And as the previous Treasurer, that's the focus I took, and it's the same approach that Matt's taking. It's the same approach, and that is we will use our financial strength to invest in our businesses. But the more support we provide our businesses now, the better off our state and country will be. And so when I was Treasurer, I would have those arguments uh, with the Federal Treasurer, uh, and the current Treasurer is doing the same. And they're important. It shouldn't be seen, it shouldn't be seen to be a problem. It should be seen to be a government that continues to do what it has always done, and that's fight for every single business across this state. And the reality is we made decisions over two years through public health orders to keep people safe. And we have an obligation as a government to support businesses through the decisions that we made. The biggest impact there's been, there's been an argument out there that, no bus that businesses have not been affected by public health orders. That is just completely untrue. Businesses are affected by public health orders over the summer period because of significantly furloughed workforces. And businesses had to close because they didn't have staff, because their staff were doing what they needed to do, and that was isolate for a period of time. And so 
Will you have ongoing support well into the future? Probably not as we move through this phase. But we are in a transitionary phase right now, as Dr Chant has said. That's creating challenges as we move through. I'm incredibly confident with the approach that we take, that the Treasurer is taking, as we always have during uh, the last two years, that we'll get as many businesses through and keep as many people employed. Well, I don't know, um, but I know that through the discussions I had as a former treasurer in relation to this space, that working together in partnership has helped our businesses get through. Now, the federal government's provided significant financial support over the last two years through the JobKeeper program. Uh, that kept many people employed in circumstances where there would have been a disconnect between their employer and their employee, and there'd be more people out of work. We have been incredibly successful in our country in not just having a strong health response, but in addition, having a strong economic response too. And that strong economic response has come because we've been able to leverage our financial ability at, a both, at both state and Commonwealth level to provide that fiscal support. And ultimately, budgets don't exist in a vacuum. Budgets are there to use to help our people, to help our businesses to help vulnerable people across New South Wales who have struggled during this pandemic. Just like the announcement today is there to help mums and dads across the state balance work and family life. So as a former Treasurer, and I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the current Treasurer, that's how we see our jobs. We don't see the job of the Treasurer in a pandemic to simply be there to nickel and dime. We see our job during a pandemic to get people through and come out stronger the other side. That's been our approach for two years, and I can tell you, it's not going to change because it works. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's the same answer to the, as to, to the last question. Um, and, and that is that, yes, there will be more cases. Let me deal with the first party question. There will be more cases, but I'm seeing confidence come back. We were out yesterday um, with, um, with the Treasurer announcing the financial package. The national plan was 70 to 80 per cent. We've got, everyone has gone out and been vaccinated in record numbers. We can
be able to deploy like we have during this pandemic, but for those years of work. And that is often forgotten. It is not a incidence that New South Wales has provided more financial support than any other jurisdiction. It's not a coincidence because we could do it. Because we could do it. And we also, through being strong economic managers in this, in this state, know the connection between strong financial management and, and, and economic growth. And if you deploy your financial power, the economy grows, businesses stay open, people stay in work, and the budget ultimately as well is better off down the back end. So our approach works. It's worked for two years and it's going to continue to work. Now, when I was treasurer, I'd have the same arguments. We're not interested in division. We're interested in unity. Always been focused on that. Doesn't mean we're not going to have our fights from time to time. I've had plenty in my time. But ultimately, we're not doing that for the sake of it. We're doing it for our people. And that is our focus because we want every single person and every single business right across this state to get through. And I don't know, nor does anyone, not even Dr. Chan, about what challenges will come our way from a health perspective moving forward. But I can tell you this, in this state, we are prepared. We are prepared in our health system. We've done that from the outset of the pandemic. We probably bought too many ventilators, but better to have them than not have them. Uh, we increased our capacity. We've show, we show that every single week in terms of where we sit. We have the best health system in the country by a long way. I know that as somebody who sits in national cabinet and sees the situation. We have the best health system. You can't turn on that you can't get to a pandemic and say, time to invest in health. No, you do it over years and years and years. And our record spending and investments in health has set up our health system so we can keep people safe. And in addition to that, our financial management has put us in a position where it's an absolute no-brainer uh, for the treasurer to say, we're going to invest to get you through because our job ultimately is not to protect the budget. Our job is to protect our people. Yeah, I, and I raised this point yesterday. We have said from the outset, regardless whose responsibility it actually lies with, that we are here to help. We are happy to provide that assistance. Now, uh, we've already had this discussion with Susan Pearce, who's the Deputy Secretary, and um, uh, I might get her to come along um, tomorrow and we can provide, to provide some further information in relation um, to this space. But there's no doubt, we, we, have an, we have an obligation in our state to get this booster program rolled out as quickly and as efficiently as possible. That's why we set up the, our 40 centres to assist the GP and pharmacist network. We've done... Yeah, well, and, and, and as I've said, Chris, whatever we can do to help, we will. Just like rapid antigen tests, we went out day one, ordered 150 million. We went out and did that because we knew that was more than pro a lot more than what we needed. But if a need arises that's outside our responsibility, we are happy to help. Our job is to represent people right across New South Wales, regardless uh, whose area of responsibility it's in. Now, are the, those, those numbers in aged care, in terms of not receiving boosters, are a concern for me and a concern for our government. But, if we're, but we, are, we stand ready to provide any further assistance. Obviously, we don't want that in any way to compromise where our areas of responsibility are. And so it's, a, it's, certainly, it's certainly a balance, but there's no doubt those figures are concerning. And you know, if, if we can provide assistance to the federal government, we will. Well, I, 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 I've, I've spoken, I, we've already raised with Susan Pearce, who's the Deputy Secretary, who has responsibility in that space here in, in New South Wales. But ultimately, as I've said, we, the supply is there, the appointments are there in order for further support to be provided to that sector. And if we can assist, we will. I'm not sure it's as simple as, um, it, it's a simple operation. We all have different areas of responsibility. We're doing everything we can. I'm focused every day on promoting that clear message to get boosted in one of our centres or through your GP and pharmacist. But 
ultimately we've taken responsibility in a whole range of areas, particularly, I'd say, regional and remote Aboriginal communities. That wasn't in our responsibility, but we went out and did it. We went, and we went out and did it while other states waited. And if you, if you look at the vaccination rates in, in Indigenous communities in regional and remote New South Wales, they're leading the way because we took it on ourselves where we could to go out door to door to provide that assistance. And our health teams work around the clock. They've worked around the clock for two years to keep people safe. Any assistance we can provide in New South Wales, we will. Premier, Premier. Um, well, we've obviously, um, through the roadmap, we have the date being the 27th of February, um, where there's still a number of restrictions, and one of the restrictions we have in place is if you can work from home, work from home. Um, but, but ultimately, I think as we move through, we'll be wanting people to go back to the office just like we did last year. And you know, we, we held two summits last year to get people back into the cities in Parramatta and Sydney, the, uh, the CBD, to breathe life back into those those centres and particularly feel for some of those struggling businesses. Um, um, it, it may be, that's not, that's not, that wasn't in my thinking. <laughs> I think it's a coincidence because that's not in my thinking. My, my think, the thinking behind these vouchers is to provide support for families. Uh, we want to help mums and dads right across the state. Um, so no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that they, that one. It's a coincidence. <laughs> a happy coincidence. Yes. Premier, Premier. Uh, just, just briefly on the, the rapid antigen test rollout yep. of schools. I know this is probably still going on and you know, you probably don't have enough data coming in from schools all over the state. Mm -hmm. Do you have a rough idea of you know, what kind of percentage uh, there is now in terms of parents actually coming in and getting the rapid antigen test and how many parents have it? Yeah, um, so obviously we've had uh, more than 8 million tests now go out to schools right across New South Wales. I had a message this morning from the Head of School Infrastructure. The next batch is on the way and will start to be shipped out to some of the regional communities for weeks three and four. So this is something that will obviously uh, keep continuing over the next four weeks as we provide these to school communities. At this point, it's really anecdotal evidence that we're getting coming through our principals. Many schools made them available on Friday. Uh, I know some made them available over the weekend for working parents to come in and pick up as well. Uh, and also some test collections happening today as well before students starting tomorrow. So uh, certainly so far what principals and teachers are telling me is that parents are coming in droves to pick up these kits. Really positive feedback knowing that it is just that you know another tool in the kit that you can use before your child starts school uh, and obviously you know as the, the days and weeks progress we'll get a better understanding of the usage of these kits how many positive cases we're seeing and also get that feedback from parents and students and our principals and teachers in terms of the use and the effectiveness of the kits Yeah, well, look, obviously for early childhood in New South Wales, we've prioritised providing these surveillance kits out to our staff. We've got some 5,800 early childhood services in New South Wales. We're the biggest part of the sector here in this state, and that's where we are providing those tests. Uh, look, I'm aware that other colleagues around the country have talked about you know, what we might need to do for uh, the younger year groups, and I'd probably defer to Kerry Chan. I, think, I don't think there's a rapid antigen test for under two-year-olds, and, and the effectiveness of the younger children, I think, is... is um, you know, can be questioned. But ultimately, too, I also think that there's a, a role for the federal government here. You know, they fund and run the majority of those early childhood services. And so I'm sure it's something that education ministers will talk about. We're due to meet next week. I'd be very surprised if looking at things in the early childhood sector aren't part of those discussions. Uh, well, only primary school students attend before and after school care. So that's the way the system's set up. Yep. Just quickly, there's been a new survey put out saying, uh, but basically, large numbers of parents are extremely concerned about the impact of the last few years on, 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 on mm -hmm. child welfare, education particularly, and talking about after school care and tutors. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought or any conversation about potentially investment in that area to give 
kids catch up opportunities mm -hmm. they feel like they've fallen back a long way? Yeah, well, look, we've already got our COVID intensive learning tuition program running. We ran it last year. Some $330 million were invested last year to do it. This year it's up. It's more than $370 million. Thank you, Treasurer, for that extra money. Uh, so what we will see in, in place this year is that small group tuition in all of our public primary schools and high schools, uh, in our low fee paying Catholic and independent schools as well, to do exactly that, to provide that support for students who might be behind in their learning and who need to catch up. It's a significant investment all up. With, it's close to three quarters of a billion dollars that we will have spent over that two year period to help our students to catch up. But I also think that report reiterates again why we've been here day after day talking about how important it is for children to be at school. We know that it's the best educational setting for them. We know that, that it's a much better learning environment, but also the mental health, the social aspects, the routine, the impact that that can have on study uh, and educational outcomes. It really is multifaceted, the reasons why we need to make sure we have our children back at school. Uh, look, not at this stage. I mean, obviously, we are uh, rolling out this system. It's a significant investment uh, in that small group tuition and, and the, that learning uh, in a school environment already. I have to say, again, speaking to teachers and principals, particularly during the lockdown period last year, where that tuition was still available online, every single one of them who I met with said, please continue it for the 2022 school year. I'm so pleased we've been able to do that. I think it's really important that we provide that support to our students. And like I said, the feedback has been overwhelming in terms of the difference that it's made. Our data shows that it is having the effect that we want, which is helping students catch up on their lost learning. So that's our commitment to deliver that program and to deliver it well. Yeah, look, it's something that we've done in the past. You know, I think uh, last term we had maybe about a dozen examples where we worked with local, uh, particularly local health districts, to provide them at schools where we didn't have a high take up in that community. The bottom line is we are available. Every single school site can be used as a vaccination hub should the need arise, but we will be driven or guided, I guess, by New South Wales Health in terms of when that happens. Like I said, it has happened a few times in the past towards the end of last year. We work very closely with Susan Pearce and her team. Uh, if there is a need to do that in particular areas, if New South Wales Health want us to be a part of that drive out of vaccines, we're happy to do so. I mean, obviously taking into account that the vaccines need to be stored correctly, you need to have the right setup and infrastructure in order to do that. My understanding is there's a plethora of appointments available for that vaccine, whether it's at the GP, uh, the pharmacy or at a, a New South Wales Health Hub. But like I said, we, we've said doors are open. If you need any school New South Wales Health at any time to help with vaccinations, we're here and ready to do it. Uh, look, I think New South Wales Health has been really open to looking at all we can do to support the community get vaccinated. Um, I think the key issues for us is just monitoring the uptake through the usual methods. Uh, many uh, parents have expressed the desire and the uh, GPs have indicated too in consultations that a lot of parents will prefer to take their five to 11 year olds to general practice. And so to some extent we were monitoring the uptake. Obviously pharmacies are also a trusted um, source locally in, a, in an environment familiar to the, to the young child. We, notwithstanding, we've done some amazing, made our vaccination clinics really fun for young people. So also that's an alternative. We will, um, as we go forward, and if we're seeing lagging in some areas, we'll explore all the range of options. And as the minister had said, we have done some vaccination in school sites, and it's been very targeted. We're finding that the targeted approach to identify where there might be other barriers to access um, is really the approach we need to take to lift the overall vaccination uh, rates. How concerned are you about, firstly, cases going elsewhere? How high could they go with schools? And secondly, obviously we do have a bit of a sluggish uptake in the 12 to 15 year olds you mentioned uh, in vaccinations. Are there different rules for families if they're unvaccinated child test positive for or remember their family? Are there OK, the first question is whether cases will go up or go down. Um, as I said, we're not particular. You know, we we no longer just look at a single measure, and cases don't tell us that alone. I mean, people are doing rat testing, and people are changing their testing behaviours overall. So, no single piece of data tells the full picture. So, we'll be looking at hospitalisations and other factors. But we know that if people get boosted, they can actually put downward pressure 
on both hospitalisations and also transmission. Um, if you are boosted, you are less likely to acquire the infection and so they're le therefore less likely to spread the infection. And so the question will be how quickly we can continue to get that booster uptake. It also is determined by how what actions individuals are taking. Um, are people um, going out and about when they've got symptoms or are they getting a test um, using a rat or a PCR test and, and taking those isolation uh, requirements seriously? Those actions will dictate whether we see an in um, and then on the other hand, we're going to see some more interactions between groups that haven't act interacted over, the, over this period. And so you've got almost counteracting forces. And to some extent, the question will be if we can get those boosters in, if we can get people to still maintain some of those COVID safe practices, that could offset um, the increased mobility. Um, that's why when I answer this question, I often say it is in people's hands, but I took a little bit more time to explain what I mean by that. It's because we've got some forces um, that are protecting us against a transmission surge. And you can remember when we went through that Delta wave, where we actually saw declining case numbers even when we we're opening up. And that's because we had that protection afforded by having those um, high levels of vaccination. And that's why it is so critical with Omicron to get that added protection from the third dose. Dr. Chairman, I've been looking at the data over the last couple of weeks of the deaths. Um, men seem to die far higher rates than women. Is there a reason for that? Look, I think this is often observed in infectious diseases, and I actually read an article as well um, of, of why this might be. And I suppose it's a question of um, higher rates of underlying um, other, other health behaviours which might predispose them. So high rates of smoking in men, which might predispose them to those factors. There are also some behavioural factors that might play into it um, and other socioeconomic factors. So like all things, it's complex, but it is a marked trend that has been observed um, nationally um, that men seem to be um, more, you know, experiencing high mortality. And I think it's a really important area we tease out and look for any preventable aspects of, um, of going forward. Look, I think that as we transition, um, you know, the transition has happened so quickly and Omicron's thrust us into that um, transition. I, I think we do need to reflect on how we approach COVID into the future and a focus on symptomatic um, individuals may well be the future, but at the moment we have, we want to really explore um, the tools of, that we have, which is the asymptomatic screening. Um, I just remind parents that even if your child has symptoms and you have a negative rat test, rapid antigen test, please keep that child home. Um, please access a PCR test preferably um, or do repeat the rat in 24 hours and only attend school if the symptoms resolve and you've got another plausible explanation. Um, the tests perform best in the presence of symptoms um, and it may but will be moving forward, we switch our strategies more to a focus on symptomatic individuals. Premier, this is letter. You were very strong in your comments yesterday towards the federal government. You released this letter. Uh, the president president has been very clear that they're not going to come to the table. Do you expect a response to your letter or what do you think is going to happen? Well, I do expect a response to the letter. I expect the federal government to stand by small business, just like the New South Wales government is standing by small business. This is not the time for austerity. This is the time to be supporting our economy so that we can bounce back better on the other side. These are not just New South Wales businesses, they're Australian businesses, and they need their national government to step up and support them when they need it most. We know that restaurants, cafes, hairdressers, the personal services industry are getting absolutely smashed at the moment. The mums and dads of New South Wales that pay their taxes to the Commonwealth Government expect the Commonwealth Government to stand up, not stand aside. This will cost private votes, won't it? Well, um, my focus is on standing up for small businesses in New South but Wales, and I'm clearly asking. Private vote for the decision taken in New South Wales. This will cost the federal government votes in the upcoming election. Well, what will uh, what will support? What, what I want to see 
is coalition governments right across the country and including in Canberra, because it's coalition governments that always stand up for small business. That's what we're doing here in New South Wales, and we'd welcome the Commonwealth standing beside us to support those small businesses that have been so devastated through this latest Omicron wave. The New South Wales government has followed the national plan. The New South Wales government has implemented the decisions of the national cabinet. So it's up to the national government to stand by the state government in supporting those businesses that have been impacted by those national decisions, not step away from them. Premier, uh, New, South, uh, New South Wales Health changed its advice for positive COVID cases just yesterday, cutting out some wording which was uh, apparently confusing positive cases and leading them to leave uh, isolation early before their seven, mandatory seven days was up. Uh, two years on, they're still making rudimentary errors like this. Uh, do you assess that an error like this would have led to thousands of more people getting the virus? And, and just quickly, if I can add a secondary question on, uh, you mentioned, was it 150 million rats in New South Wales government as ordered? Uh, how much did that cost? I'll have to get the figure for you, so I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll take that on notice in terms of the cost. I think it was around a billion dollars, but I'll, 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 check, I'll check the cost for you. I think it's around a billion. Um, but once again, money well spent. The rats are allowing us to provide a safe environment to get kids back in the classroom on day one. New South Wales and Victoria are the only jurisdictions that are able to do that. And we provided uh, here in New South Wales extra rat tests to the ACT government. So the ACT government can have their kids back in the classroom on day one. So we've been able to help. I said, like, when it comes to supporting the federal government or support other governments around the country, we're happy to do that because we want everyone to get through this uh, as a country. And we always, to Matt's point, you know, one of the pleasing things about New South Wales being part of the government here for two years, as former Treasury and now Premier, is that we've always acted in the national interest. We've always seen ourselves, unlike others, as Australians first. And that's a defining aspect of our state and our people. And, um, and we'll continue that approach. In relation to the health issue, well, you know, our health teams have been under immense pressure for two years. We have the best health teams in the country, if not the world. When we were notified of that yesterday, um, the discussions I had with the health minister, Brad Hazard, and, and Dr. Champ, was the amendment was made to clarify, um, to clarify um, that position. Each and every day, we have stood up and it can get confusing during the pandemic because the, the, the messages have changed over the course of two years. Even more recently, we went from an isolation period of 10 to 14 days and then made an isolation period to seven days. That may change again in the future. We've made other changes which have been confusing but important at a national level, like the change to close contacts and what was actually defined as a close contact evolved into a household contact or someone you've spent more than four hours with at a home. It can be very difficult as you're moving through this period of time for um, those messages to, to remain consistent because they're not. They've had to change as we've adapted to the uh, evolving situation with the pandemic. And, and, the more, and they're almost certainly going to change again. Um, now, our health teams have clarified um, that message but I'll, I'll back in our health teams here in our state. I've worked with our health teams as Treasurer and now as Premier for two years. So in terms, of, in terms of the health response in this state, it is second to none, and that's because of the hard work day in, day out our health teams have made. In any, in any pandemic, there will always be issues that come up. And, they, and when they do come up, what's most important is that you address them you rectify those issues and ensure um, that there's a, a better result. And that's exactly what happened yesterday. But I'll tell you, as Premier of this state, I will back in our health team every single day of the week and twice on Sunday. Okay, Thanks. Quickly, very quickly, um, are you having any discussions about cruise travel or cruise ships restarting? Um, we, we haven't at the moment, but I'm happy to check for that. Check Ash and come back to you. Thanks.